get out or or someone now has to travel two hours uh, around or, or a very long distance around for their daily commute. Um, and then is the community prepared to react? Is there an emergency uh, emergency response plan in place? If there's not, is one being developed? Uh, can folks work with the county or at the regional level to create those um, plans? Uh, how's the community affected? Tourism, business, uh, uh, commerce, economic uh, engines uh, are often uh, slowed uh, because of uh, natural disasters. Also, government, if, depending on uh, communities where there's a lot of government uh, agencies and, and other kinds of services. Uh, how long will the cleanup take and what's affected and how much does that cost? Uh, this is a statistic that I, I heard once about uh, businesses and, and two out of every three businesses that get flooded will never reopen. And maybe it is that that, bu that building becomes reoccupied by a new business, uh, but perhaps the, the business, the person who was le leasing the space or using the space, that business doesn't uh, ever return. And just a couple of, ex of examples of, of what I would consider catastrophic flooding events uh, recently in New York. Uh, we have folks on this call, by the way, throughout the Northeast, but uh, we have uh, most of the folks who are on this webinar are uh, in New York, so I, I used some New York specific examples. But I think we've all seen uh, the kind of damage that can occur from these kinds of flooding and, and natural disasters. So this is a flood, a picture of a flood in Binghamton from 2011. Uh, this is the second such flood that Binghamton had. Uh, they had another flood in 2006. And most people wouldn't think of Syracuse, this is a picture of Syracuse as a flood prone area, uh, but in 2011, I think, uh, that same summer, um, we had flooding here, uh, two inches of rain in 30 minutes and about $50 million in damages just to city infrastructure. That doesn't necessarily uh, quantify um, private property uh, and some of the suburban areas that were also affected by this flooding. So who cares, right? I mean, we can learn to live with floods, and in fact, in, in many ways, we should learn to live with floods. Um, but here are some reasons why uh, you might care, uh, particularly if you're a local elected official. Um, uh, Flood damage to homes, property, cropland, landowner complaints. Uh, you know, sometimes there are minor flooding incidents that may, you know, flood someone's backyard or their front yard or the garage or <clears throat> uh, move sediment across roadways into people's driveways, et cetera. Um, so not every flood event is a major catastrophe. Groundwater quality and quantity, jobs and quality of life issues, and certainly, again, if you're an elected official, uh, municipal costs. The day-to-day the -day costs of having uh, somebody from the Department of Public Works or from the Highway Department going out and, and clearing roadside ditches or reconstructing roadside ditches or dealing with uh, perpendicular flows, so um, streams that uh, that cross perpendicularly under uh, through culverts or bridges, uh, roadways. Um, that's stormwater management. Uh, it's also part of the highway department, right? Because it is a roads issue. But that's stormwater management and thinking about better ways or, or different ways to uh, use people's time to manage stormwater and be strategic about it. So anyway, I'll get to that when we talk about asset management planning a little bit uh, later. I, I forgot to mention at the top of the call that uh, we, if, if you have any questions, please uh, type them in your chat box. You all have a control panel that should be uh, to the right of your computer. <coughs> Excuse me. And then several, uh, several lines down is a chat box. And if you click on that arrow, it'll open up a chat. And if you drop in a question there, uh, we'll collect them and, and answer them at the end of the webinar. So, for many communi communities, it's a good question to ask, who's in charge of watershed management, uh, stormwater management? And again, you know, we could talk a lot about watersheds and how that influences the um, flood events, uh, particularly downstream events, um, and uh, how managing at the watershed level um, can, uh, can really be most beneficial to protect from flooding uh, events. 
So who's in charge of watershed management? Um, all of these answers are true. <laughs> in most cases, no one, but all of the above. Right, so everybody has a stake in watershed management, from private landowners to regulators who are interested in water quality, uh, surface water quality, groundwater recharge, the planning, planning and zoning boards, uh, and how they engage with the site, site plan review process, business owners, elected officials, highway departments, etc. So, every, at every step of the way, there is. Uh, there should be a mechanism for thinking about how we manage water on, uh, on public and private properties. So uh, just a, a little bit more about the different roles people play. Uh, so most of us are, are landowners first, right? Um, aside from the other things that we do. So learning how to manage our own stormwater, uh, particularly in rural communities, certainly suburban and urban as well, but in rural communities where people tend to have longer driveways uh, and, and a lot of that water comes off the roof, uh, down the sidewalk, down the driveway, into the, public, uh, into the public domain, and then becomes managed by, uh, in, by the public domain, by local tax dollars. Uh, certainly in urban and suburban areas that happens as well. Everyone's water runs from their roof onto their driveway down to the street. But if we can catch that water before it hits the road, we, we are serving the public good, right? We're helping the public utility by managing some of our own stormwater. Um, and so both at a residential and at a business level, and an institutional level, we can think about how to manage stormwater. Uh, and the carrier dome image that I showed earlier is another example of an institution like Syracuse University um, managing its own stormwater by reusing it first. So most of us are landowners. Planning and zoning, that site plan review is, is a critical component to local government in, engagement in how, um, how uh, development occurs um, and how that stormwater can be managed on site, particularly using green infrastructure. Highway and DPW, uh, we'll talk a little more about this in a bit, but inspecting, repairing, and replacing uh, critical stormwater infrastructure, particularly where it um, intersects with uh, roadways, uh, and then elected officials, thinking about policies that, um, that influence uh, better stormwater management. One brief example might be uh, to, to consider um, parking lots and the number of spaces that are, the minimum number of spaces that are required for a lot of development, particularly urban and suburban development. Um, you know, I use the joke sometimes about Home Depot. The Home Depot lot never fills up, maybe on Memorial Day, um, but yet they're required because of the square footage of their building to have a certain number of spaces. If we can right-size uh, our pervious uh, development, excuse me, our impervious development, um, we can uh, take the first and, and in some ways the easiest step at uh, ma better managing stormwater. So I mentioned a couple of times, stormwater asset management, right? So here is uh, a quick seven steps to how to create an asset, a stormwater asset management plan. Um, some of you may be familiar already with the term asset management, particularly w when it is uh, in reference to um, uh, uh, gray infrastructure, right? Like so pipes and, and, and treatment plants. Um, so when we're talking about water, wastewater infrastructure. So uh, the first step in, in developing a stormwater management plan would be to inventory all the stormwater infrastructure, and, some, and particularly in, in rural communities, um, but also in, in, other, in urban and suburban um, communities, stormwater inventory or stormwater assets aren't always uh, what we might think they are. So thinking about ditches, What's the state of the ditch? Is it scoured? Is it, ero is it eroding? Is it undercut? Um, how much, uh, you know, how, how many um, uh, drainage pipes and, and outlets enter or exit that ditch? Um, also thinking about other types of infrastructure to, that carries or channelizes water, culverts and bridges. Um, and outlets, so what are the conditions, so inventory all of those things, locate them, know where they are. 
Then the next step is what's the condition that they're in? Um, so again, my example with the ditches, is it, is it eroded? Is it, uh, is it scoured? Um, how, uh, how well is it doing its job? Um, is, is a drain pipe or, or a culvert rusted? Is it, um, is it, is it clogged? Uh, is, has it been damaged in some way? How well is it doing its job? Then step number three, how critical is that piece of infrastructure? So if a culvert failed, uh, would the road wash out? If the road washed out, how many people, businesses, properties, et cetera, would be affected? How expensive would that repair be? Uh, if, a, if a ditch got clogged, um, you know, how critical is that? Uh, would it overwash, would it essentially the sheet flow across the road causing very little damage, just maybe a minor inconvenience? Um, so the critical, answering number three has to, have be a little bit thoughtful uh, because how you define critical in your community for your infrastructure is somewhat subjective. So you can uh, decide that you know it's it, that roadways uh, undercutting a roadway, replacing roadbeds um, is 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 very important because of the financial impact. Uh, but you may also look at um, the quality of life impacts. Um, as part of the criticalness of any infrastructure, uh, looking at how um, businesses are affected or people's commutes or, or flooding garages and basements. So you can look at different ways to measure criticality. And then the fourth step is you rank and prioritize those. And I'll show you a diagram in, a, in the next slide here of what that can look like. And then once you rank and prioritize those, what are the one, what are the what are the projects that are, uh, that are very critical and in not good condition? Uh, so you start to, and how much will that cost and when should we put that into our capital improvement plan uh, for expenditure to uh, implement that project? So you, you create your capital improvement plan uh, all along having this asset advisory committee to help inform this process uh, and then using that asset advisory committee to educate uh, the public uh, and, uh, and perhaps other uh, government officials, elected or staff, so that you can move forward with your plan. So this is just a very brief overview of, of what a stormwater asset management plan process could look like. But once you enter into the process, it's very effective. So again, thinking about condition, you know, is this culvert in good condition? Probably not. Is it doing its job? Most likely not. And then thinking about, well, how critical is this fit? Is this infrastructure uh, now that it has failed? And then uh, this is a picture from Southern Tompkins County uh, last June. Um, what's the impact of, of, a, of a failure of, of stormwater infrastructure? So you can see this roadway was essentially overtopped um, and the, the culverts were um, uh, essentially probably clogged with debris. Uh, you see the backhoe digging the debris out so the culverts can, uh, the function of the culverts can be restored. Uh, and again, you know, what's the impact? Who lives on this road? How vital is this roadway? How much is it going to cost uh, to replace this? So this is what I was talking about when you rank and prioritize your projects. So alongside you have probability, uh, which is condition. Um, so uh, what's the probability of failure? Uh, and that's based on the, the, the physical condition of the asset. And then along the top, you have the impact, criticality. How many people will it impact? Or what areas of life will it impact? Business, residents, property owners, economic, quality of life kinds of um, measures. And then you, you essentially plot them on a graph similar to this. And the things in high, you want to cost out and put on your capital improvement plan to, uh, to, uh, to, to fund and, and implement as quickly as possible. And all, you know, really, a lot of the things in the medium uh, as well can be in that capital improvement plan. And there could certainly be some low-hanging fruit items that can be done pretty much right away, maybe not even being in any sort of capital improvement plan because the cost to implement or replace that infrastructure uh, is, is may be uh, negligible. 
All right, so at this point, um, Jen Cotting is with us, and uh, I'm going to pass it off to her to talk a little bit about finance and funding. Thanks, Chris. Um, so you've got these plans that Chris just described. You've done your, your inventory, and you've figured out what, you've need, what you need to do, what your priorities are. So now how are you going to pay for it? And, um, you know, next slide, please. Our centers, uh, the EFC network, we work with a lot of communities trying to figure out how to um, help them develop financing strategies to pay for the resource uh, management activities that they want to see happen on the ground. So we've had some experience in developing effective financing strategies um, over the years, and we see that they really effective financing strategies tend to have some common elements. They tend to be community-based, first and foremost. Um, there's a really critical need for local buy-in, even for projects or programs that span beyond jurisdictional boundaries. Um, with the local issues at play that require local solutions, um, it's not to say that there's not a role for state or federal government in resilience planning and implementation of financing, but really the driving force behind what happens on the ground needs to be rooted in, in the local community context. Um, secondly, the effective financing strategies tend to be integrated, and by integrated, I just, you know, diversity is going to be the key to stability for a financing strategy. Um, successful financing strategies pull from a, a collection of funding types um, rather than relying on any one funding source or any one type of financing mechanism. And then finally, um, effective financing strategies tend to mirror the resource, and by that I really just mean that you know, resilience efforts span a variety of, of land use types and landowners and associated stakeholders, and the supporting financing strategy for, re, for resilience plans um, really should do the same thing, and they should be engaging um, everyone who's contributing to the problem, but also everyone who benefits from the solution. Next slide. So the components of a financing strategy, when we work with communities on developing um, financing strategies, we encourage a mix of mechanisms. We, we really start with looking at cost reducing strategies to minimize the, the, the bottom line price tag as much as possible. Um, then we start looking at developing revenue streams that can support implementation over time. And we also look for um, opportunities to incorporate market-based approaches. And, and for, for our purposes today, um, we'll focus on market-based approaches that, that are really designed to incentivize and engage the private sector. Next slide. So looking at cost-reducing mechanisms, um, you know, there are a number of them we have listed out here. It's certainly not a comprehensive list, but you know, in planning, you know, starting with planning. Planning may not sound like a cost-reducing strategy, but plans can really do a few things that are really valuable. First of all, um, having a good plan will guide your spending decision-making, and that's going to make sure that your limited resources are only invested in efforts that, have, that your community has identified as a priority. Um, secondly, you know, as Chris indicated earlier, in talking about good asset management, um, it means Small investments today can help avoid some of those really costly and you know, disastrous um, emergency situations down the line. So always investing in, in everyday operations and maintenance now is, is going to go a long way in helping avoid catastrophes later. And finally, you know, on, on the idea of planning, when you can demonstrate to potential funders that the investment in your project um, that you're requesting is part of a larger, long-term, more comprehensive plan that can go a really long way in securing outside funding for, for what you're trying to uh, for what you're trying to do for implementation of certain elements of your your resili resiliency planning. Um, it, and again, because of all the different components that go into resilience. Um, Beyond water quality and quantity management, things like emergency response and public safety and energy and transportation, and you know, you see where I'm going with this. It really requires coordination with other community priorities. And the benefit of doing cross-priority planning is that when you you're making one investment in resilience, but it's delivering multiple community benefits. 
And that creates efficiencies that that lower the overall cost to the community. Um, tools like zoning and codes and ordinances, you know, Chris alluded to this a little bit earlier, you know, they can reduce the cost associated with resource management. They can direct growth away from environmentally or culturally sensitive areas, um, can limit the number of parcels available develop for development, it can reduce the runoff and nutrient loads that come with additional impervious surface, um, and they set the bar for what kind of offsets, such as maybe tree canopy improvements or the like, that, that need to take place um, as, a, as, a, as an offset to um, impacts to the landscape. And then finally, Collaboration across local agencies um, with community stakeholder groups, with neighboring communities, can reduce the financial burden to any one of those entities um, in accomplishing what, they, what they're trying to do, can open up opportunities to tap into other skill sets, um, other capacities, um, access to equipment or other resources that maybe a community wouldn't otherwise have access to. Um, and collaborating really makes sense, too, with particular when we're talking about water resources, because watersheds simply don't follow jurisdictional boundaries, and so it can make a lot of sense to collaborate with, with neighbors. Next slide. And so the revenue generators. Well, we all know about grants. Grants are wonderful. Um, Chris and I frequently work off of um, grant projects. Um, they're, they're great for um, pilot projects, for building momentum around an initiative, um, but honestly, because of their finite nature, they're just not going to be sufficient to sustain a broader resilience, resiliency program over time. They're great for individual finite projects, but, but they, they probably don't want to be what you rely on for the overall long-term um, implementation of a, of a resiliency program. So that brings us to dedicated revenue streams. And, and this can be a touchy subject for folks, um, particularly folks, decision makers in local government, because this can, you know, having to suggest a new tax or fee can be very politically unpopular. And, and we're very sensitive, the EFCs are very sensitive to that. But a lot of communities are turning to establishing dedicated revenue streams to support their water resource management programs. Um, dedicated fees deliver a steadier and more reliable funding stream than um, having your program competing for general fund dollars with things like fire and safety and schools and, and other really important local, service, local services. Um, there are a couple great examples from New York of communities who have taken um, a little bit different approach from one another in terms of developing um, a, a dedicated revenue stream. Um, the first, in 2014, um, Ithaca shifted from relying on property taxes to support their stormwater program um, to a fee-based fee system that was um, rooted in uh, a, the amount of a property's impervious surface. Under this system, um, one, two, and three family homes, excuse me, family homes are considered to have an average amount of impervious surface. Um, and they're charged a flat rate of $12 a quarter, so $48 a year if you're in a, a one, two, or three family home. Um, other parcels are charged $12 per quarter for each unit of average impervious surface on their property. You can, as you can imagine, this, this can add up kind of quickly for some of the properties that have a larger footprint. Um, the, uh, the Wegmans, for example, is paying somewhere around $12,000 annually. Uh, the city itself is paying about $46,000 annually based on, um, on, on city-owned property. And, uh, and Cornell, who probably has the largest footprint um, in, in the community, it, their, their bill is coming out to be around $130,000 annually. But there are opportunities to reduce the amount of the fee um, by removing impervious surface, and you can obtain credits um, for the, on the fee for property owners who install best management practices and address stormwater right on their, their own property. These systems like this are often thought of as being uh, more equitable than relying on property taxes because the amount of the fee is being more directly tied to the amount of runoff a property is contributing um, to the issue. And it's anticipated that uh, Ithaca's fee is going to raise around $800,000 annually in funds that will be specifically dedicated to implementing water quality and water quantity management practices. 
Now, Chautauqua County took a slightly different approach um, using a tax rather than a, than a fee. They have a 5% occupancy tax, um, often referred to as a bed tax on lodging within the county. Now, 3% of the revenue generated from that uh, is devoted to increasing tourism in the county. However, the other 2% is solely dedicated to the enhancement and protection of lakes and streams in the county. Um, it, the, that 2% supports a grants program for lakes and waterways that uh, provides financial assistance to public agencies, private organizations, uh, county residents for projects that enhance and protect the lakes and waterways of the county. And so I, I like this example because I think it's a really great example of recognizing the value to the local economy that maintaining their natural resources delivers. Next slide. So engaging the private sector. Um, relying solely on the public sector to support all of your resilience or water resource management needs is probably not going to deliver the scale of revenue required to accomplish everything that you would like to or need to accomplish. So at some point it becomes very important to figure out ways to incentivize the private sector, um, get their engagement in developing and implementing and financing resiliency solutions. So um, an example from where my EFC is located here in uh, College Park, Maryland, we're in Prince George's County, which is um, has what we call a phase one stormwater permit. These are um, not the general permit with the six minimum control measures. This is a very specific to the county um, set of requirements. And in those requirements, the county has to treat 15,000 impervious acres by 2025. And the county you know, recognizes that they can't do this on their own. So they've developed a few um, ways of engaging private property owners to become involved that I think are kind of innovative. So the county does have a Clean Water Act fee. And I'm sorry, you can't see me doing the air quotes around that. The Clean Water Act fee that was established uh, in 2013 to support the program. And the ability for property owners to reduce their fees really serves as the driver for their private sector engagement. So that fee system is really driving engaging the private sector in their stormwater management and resilience planning. So first, first of all, they have a, a rain check program. That offers cost share to homeowners and businesses uh, and other property owners for the installation of practices that reduce the quantity of runoff as well as um, practices that improve the water quality of runoff. They have a stewardship grant program that offers funds for nonprofit organizations and faith-based organizations, civic associations, educational institutions to install water quality projects and improve citizen awareness and engagement. And finally, there's an alternative compliance program that offers significant fee reductions for nonprofit and faith-based organizations. Um, they can reduce their fee by up to 25% for raising awareness of water quality issues, promotion of the rain check program, um, and using environmentally sensitive landscaping on their um, parcels. Um, reductions of up to 50% can be achieved by allowing the county to install practices on their property, um, place an easement on the portion of the property where that practice is installed, and commit to uh, providing long-term maintenance uh, on that practice. Next slide. So I'll, with that, I will kick it back to you, Chris. Yeah, so um, Jen mentioned a lot about in her last slide about engaging the private sector. Uh, just a couple of specific examples in New York about uh, where, how, where and how that's happening. The Upper Susquehanna Coalition, particularly in the southern tier of New York State, is doing a lot of great work. And part of uh, some of that work is um, uh, uh, berm removal, constructed wetlands, buybacks, and stream bed restoration to uh, allow nature to better do its job when it comes to flood mitigation uh, and, and management. Uh, in Onondaga County, uh, they have uh, a grant program to uh, incentivize green infrastructure uh, being implemented on private property. Uh, so if you were to build or rebuild a parking lot, say, uh, they would uh, pay the difference between the traditional, you know, uh, impervious, uh, maybe asphalt um, parking lot, they would pay the difference between the cost of putting it in uh, in that conventional way uh, versus putting it in 
um, as green infrastructure, as a, as a porous paving uh, product. Uh, they also uh, in, in, uh, pay for green roofs, rain gardens, uh, street tree planting, um, and, and bioswales and, and the like. Um, and, and to date, in the last five years, uh, I think they've um, awarded about 150 projects uh, through this mini grant program just in the city of Syracuse alone. Um, so uh, there are a lot of different ways to get people engaged uh, using the you know, through the private sector residents with rain barrels and and you can do this through you know rain barrel workshops where you teach people to build rain barrels how to maintain and install them or again like in Onondaga County they actually got a grant from New York State uh, to purchase and then um, and then distribute rain barrels to uh, homeowners in uh, in the city of Syracuse. There's also ways to engage civic groups and, and folks like the Boy Scouts and Cornell Cooperative Extension and, and Solon Water Conservation Districts to help you uh, design and, and maybe install stormwater practices, uh, green infrastructure in parks. Um, there's there's a, a lot of ways to engage people uh, when you think creatively and, and when you think collaboratively. And so one kind of specific example of how to engage a lot of different folks is um, uh, the Jim and Julie Bayheim Foundation's Courts for Kids program, where they build basketball courts for inner city youth. So in Syracuse, uh, they, 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 I'd say, co-funded five basketball courts uh, in city parks. Um, and so uh, the Onondaga County Save the Rain program, which is the stormwater management program, if you will, uh, for the city of Syracuse, uh, the Jim and Julie Beheim Foundation and City Parks all benefited uh, by the construction of these basketball courts and they all kind of chipped in uh, resources to get these courts um, constructed. So parks, uh, parks, uh, parks benefits from having new, new basketball courts, new kind of you know, recreational infrastructure. Jim and Julie Beheim with the Courts for Kids programs, they get basketball courts built. Obviously, the kids and the residents in the city benefit, and then uh, Save the Rain got the stormwater management from those um, porous basketball courts. And these basketball courts actually are really overbuilt. They don't, um, overbuilt in a good way. They don't manage only what falls on them. Uh, actually, uh, the stormwater drains from the roads are now redirected to an infiltration basin underneath these um, porous asphalt um, basketball courts. So they're not only managing what falls on them, but all the roads around the park as well. So those are just a few ways to, uh, you know, in incentivize the private sector and, and engage with them. So we're rounding third here, I think, uh, with this webinar. I wanted to end by sharing some funding opportunities that are on the street now. Uh, that could be really useful for you, uh, your community, your clients, uh, folks that you work with. Um, so uh, I'll kick it, kick it back to Jen for the first one, which is um, uh, from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. Yeah, thanks, Chris. So um, if, if uh, folks on the webinar today are located within the Chesapeake Bay watershed, I would encourage you to take a look at their uh, base stewardship fund. It's actually a bundle of three uh, different grant, well, two grant programs and a technical assistance program. And the focus, um, as you can imagine, is on improving bay health, so restoring and protecting habitat and water quality, advancing conservation on private lands, um, improving uh, urban stormwater management. It's a pot of about 10 to 12 million dollars annually that comes from a handful of different federal agencies as well as a couple of private sector um, folks. The RFP usually closes in May. It just closed uh, just about two weeks ago um, and with awards announced in August. Um, there are two programs, associated, two traditional grant programs associated with the Stewardship Fund. There are small watershed grants. These are awards that range from about $20,000 to $200,000. Um, projects are usually one to two years. Uh, local governments and nonprofits can access these funds. Uh, the focus, obviously, is improving local water quality. So um, 
and there is a citizen engagement component required as well as a 25% non-federal match. Um, for larger scale projects, there's the Innovative Nutrient and Sediment Reduction Grant. Um, those range, as you can see, from $200,000 to $750,000. They can, uh, they can, implementation can be up to three years. Uh, they're available to local governments and nonprofits and universities and state agencies. And they, these grants are looking for innovative approaches and broader adoption of sustainable, uh, cost-effective pollution reduction practices. There is a uh, a one-to-one non-federal match encouraged. Um, so obviously, the more that you can bring to the table, the more competitive your proposal for those would be. The third program that the uh, Bay Stewardship Fund offers is a technical assistance program designed to enhance the capacity of local governments to implement, um, and nonprofit organizations as well actually, to implement cost-effective high-impact projects that restore habitat and water quality. These are $50,000 rewards that go directly to an approved service provider that will um, provide technical assistance to that local government or nonprofit beneficiary. And there are three rounds offered. The Ag Conservation Round is usually offered in the late winter. Uh, the Restoration and Stewardship Round is opening on June 7th with proposals due June 30th. Uh, and the Stormwater Management Round opens on September 6th and is due on September 29th. So if you are a community that's located in the New York portion of the Bay, I would highly encourage you to get in touch with uh, whatever types of technical assistance providers you'd be interested in. The list of approved technical service providers, um, which includes both Chris and my EFC, um, is available on the NIFWF website. Uh, they don't get, they don't often get a lot of um, uh, proposals from the New York portion of the watershed, and they really like to spread the money around the watershed um, as, as wide and far as they can, so I would highly encourage you to take a look at that one. All right, so uh, <clears throat> for those of you who may not be aware, the New York State Consolidated Funding application has opened on May 2nd and will close on July 29th uh, the, at 4 p.m. Uh, these, uh, so the next few slides, I'm going to run through some of the state funding programs that are available through that consolidated funding application. So those include uh, the, the Community Development Block Grant through how, Homes and Community Renewal, uh, Environmental Protection Fund Grants, Waterfront Revitalization Money, uh, Local Waterfront uh, Revitalization Program through the, the Department of State, uh, and then the Climate Smart Communities Program, which the, the Climate Smart Communities Program is really an amazing program because it can fund a lot of planning processes. So I totally agree with Jen that um, to, to pay for stormwater management, watershed management, resiliency, you're doing, you should be looking uh, internally first, looking at your community and figuring out how to pay. Um, you don't want to wait 10 years for a grant that never comes to do something. Um, but there is money available uh, for projects, and there is money available, more importantly, for planning. Um, implement resiliency planning, uh, storm stormwater planning, comprehensive planning, uh, and a lot of those are within the climate smart communities bucket. Uh, some other uh, available um, funding um, through the Department of Environmental Conservation, we have the water, uh, um, the the wastewater infrastructure engineering planning grant that can include stormwater, um, the water quality improvement uh, project program. Equ uh, WQIP, uh, and then also through the Environmental Facilities Corporation, we have um, $10 million for the Green Innovation Grant Program. This is essentially a green infrastructure program. So funding stormwater, uh, this, this program funds stormwater, uh, funds green infrastructure specifically. Um, and then uh, I mentioned the Climate Smart Communities Program, uh, and then also local government efficiency grants. Again, a, a tool for planning, uh, not quite toward the uh, resiliency in the face of climate change type of planning, um, but financial, economic, quality of life uh, resiliency, looking at um, uh, efficiency through collaboration through different governments. 
All right, so the next few slides I've highlighted in red. <laughs> um, I know these are very heavy uh, wording uh, slides, but I wanted to include as much as I can. We will be, uh, we are recording this webinar and we will be posting it to our website and we'll let all registrants know um, when that's done so you can refer to it later. Um, but I've highlighted in red things focused on, on resiliency, flooding, stormwater. Um, so uh, the Community Development Block Grant uh, really has uh, three, three or four different buckets of funding, uh, public infrastructure, public facilities, economic development, uh, and there's one other I'm forgetting, I think, right now. But I focus on the public infrastructure um, because this is where you can get money for, um, for uh, stormwater activities, flood control, uh, stormwater drainage. And there's up to 25 million available across all of those programs. Oh yeah, the, the fourth uh, community development block grant program is community planning. Uh, so this is a planning grant available through um, housing and community renewal, uh, and uh, it can focus. It starts off with doing a needs assessment. Uh, is there a need for stormwater management? Is there a need for resiliency planning? Um, and then uh, ends with uh, the development of. Um, of a, of, a, of, a, of a plan that you can then use to implement some of those capital projects that can be funded through potentially this previous slide to the community development block grant to public infrastructure. So it creates the pipeline from plan to project, um, thoughtful planning to implementation of specific projects. All right, and then we have the New York State, uh, sorry for the, the alphabet soup with all the acronyms. Uh, the New York State Department of State Local Waterfront Revitalization Program. Uh, there's a lot of ways to think creatively about how to use this money. Don't think about marinas and harbors and beaches uh, only. Think about streams and creeks that are uh, channelized and running through urban or suburban areas. How to revitalize those areas. Uh, how to make those uh, water bodies assets. Um, or better assets to the communities that they travel through. Um, you'll see here again in red, um, updating an existing uh, uh, LWRP to mitigate future physical climate risks, um, redeveloping hamlets, downtowns, and urban waterfronts, uh, thinking about resiliency and, and, and the physical kind of attributes that affect that water body, but also affect those downtown, uh, those critical downtown uh, waterfront areas. Um, uh, preparing or implementing a lakewide or watershed revitalization plan. So when we're talking about watershed planning, when we're talking about collaborating with uh, adjacent governments uh, and communities, here's, here's a funding opportunity to go, come together and develop a plan around a watershed or around a lake. Uh, and then uh, implementing a community resiliency strategy. So you, you've got a plan in place. Uh, now you need to begin to implement it. Again, another uh, appropriate use for this funding. Uh, and just as a reminder, there's uh, $19.5 million available for these this, for projects in this funding category uh, this year. So the New York State DEC ESC uh, planning grants, um, these are, again, focused on wastewater. Uh, it can include green infrastructure, um, and in fact, I think it should include green infrastructure. If you cannot include green infrastructure in the project, there has to be a justification as to why it's not included. Um, and then depending on the size uh, and essentially the size and the relative wealth of the community um, and the, the type of project, uh, these planning grants are uh, at either a $30,000, $50,000, or $100,000 level. And if anybody has any questions on any of these uh, as we go through these funding programs, uh, please type them into the chat, uh, into your chat uh, bar. Um, I have uh, more, much more detail about these uh, documents in front of me uh, so I can attempt to answer those um, during the Q&A session in a, in a few minutes. All right, and then we have the New York State DEC um, e equip pro this, 
uh, excuse me, that's a mistake, WQIP. It should be WQIP, not EQIP. Um, so again, there's a lot of things that this particular um, funding source can, uh, um, can support, but these are the ones I think that are most relevant to stormwater. Uh, so green infrastructure practices, um, a feasibility study needs to be uh, completed and submitted with the application, the electronic application. Uh, I've actually done this before. Uh, the, the feasibility study does not have to be uh, what I would call intense. Essentially, if you think about green infrastructure, think of a good example, um, a green roof. Well, they want to know the feasibility of putting a green roof on that building. Will the structure uh, support it? That's whether it's feasible or not. Um, putting in uh, infiltration bed underneath a parking lot. What are the soil types? Will the water actually infiltrate? Um, it's to make sure that you've gone through the first thoughtful um, process uh, in planning a project to make sure that, you know, should you be awarded, it's something that could actually be constructed. Uh, then there's also a separate pot of money for green infrastructure practices in the Great Lakes. Um, well, I should step back, Lake Ontario and St. Lawrence Basin. Uh, for some reason that I don't know, uh, Lake Erie is not included. Uh, so all of the counties bordering Lake Ontario from Niagara County the whole way up to uh, St. Lawrence County um, are uh, able to apply for uh, these projects. <clears throat> Uh, and if you, I'll read the last line to you because I think it's, well, I'll read some of it to you, to enhance coastal resilience and promote natural engineering um, based on the shoreline uh, and really to create projects that demonstrate effectiveness uh, in, in the face of high intensity uh, storm and wave impact resilience. Uh, and then finally, in, uh, another project, uh, another project type, uh, stormwater retrofits. Uh, so going in and looking for pollutants of concern uh, this could be uh, any number of things that we have problems with in, in our northeastern water bodies and then developing a stormwater retrofit program to help reduce those. Now this, this, is, uh, this funding um, line is more uh, dedicated toward MS4 uh, programs. Then we have stream stabilization, restoration, and, and ri uh, developing riparian buffers. All help with water quality, watershed management, uh, and, and stormwater. Okay. So this is the, uh, the New York State EFC's Green Innovation Grant Program. This is round eight of the program. They've been doing this for eight years. I guess that makes sense, eight years now. Um, they started this with the AW the ARA money. Um, and uh, so this year they have 10 million to offer. They like highly visible demonstration projects because for many communities and many people, green infrastructure is still something that they're very uh, trepidatious about. Uh, and so they want to be able to show people that green infrastructure works. Um, and so uh, you'll see here to spur innovation of, in the field of stormwater management, create and maintain green wet weather infrastructure, build capacity to construct and maintain green infrastructure, and facilitate the transfer of new technologies to other areas of the state. You'll remember earlier in the webinar I showed you a picture of the Carrier Dome, um, the cistern system that was built to capture the water off the Carrier Dome was funded to the the Green Innovation Grant Program. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, green infrastructure, this is what green infrastructure is. Uh, rain gardens, green roofs, porous paving, uh, which does work in the Northeast. The University of New Hampshire Stormwater Research Center has been um, uh, researching uh, porous paving technologies for upwards of 30 years. Uh, reforestation, revegetation, uh, street tree planting, wetlands, um, constructing them or reconnecting them to, uh, to the watershed, uh, and stream daylighting as well. Uh, and, and I skipped cisterns and rain barrels. So there's a picture of a cistern here. Uh, sometimes a lot of the great thing about green infrastructure is that there's so many ancillary benefits, additional benefits. 
Um, I'll point back to the basketball court as an example of one, but also the cistern. To put a cistern on a roof, maybe at the DPW or the town barn, uh, and use that water um, to wash trucks or irrigate um, flowers or, or to, to reuse in some, some way. Uh, is, is something that more and more communities are doing. And then to capture that water from the roof also has the benefit of, you know, wherever you're drawing that water from, you're not drawing down your well or you're not paying for potable water uh, for non-potable reasons. Uh, so, all right, so climate smart communities, there's a lot of color here. I'm sorry, but there's also a lot of words. So there's two categories essentially here. One is climate protection implementation projects, um, 10.5 uh, million here. Again, this is a New York State program. Uh, and I, again, highlighted in red the things that are uh, most relevant to today's webinar. The construction of natural resiliency measures, green infrastructure, groundwater recharge, flooding mitigation, stormwater management, stream bank stabilization, et cetera. Also the relocation or retrofit of climate vulnerable um, uh, facilities. Do you have uh, public uh, or critical buildings that are in floodplains that need to be moved or raised. Um, the conservation or restoration of riparian areas and tidal marsh mitigation areas. Um, ensuring the health uh, and well-being of these areas can also, has been demonstrated to also, you know, ensure the health and well-being and resiliency of adjacent communities and, and, and infrastructure. Uh, and then reduction of flood risk, uh, construction, including design and engineering of flood risk reduction measures um, to decrease vulnerability uh, to climate change. So right sizing of bridges and culverts. So if we step back and think about the stormwater asset management planning process, and you're looking at uh, you know, the condition and the criticality of some of your infrastructure, and you realize you've got culverts or bridges or causeways or other things that are not sized for the volume that they need to manage, this is, uh, this is a place where you can um, apply to pay for part of your capital improvement plan that came out of the asset management planning process. You wouldn't take the time to go through this application process to replace one culvert, right? But to show that you've created an asset management plan and then use that plan to, um, to inform this application process would be very well received, I, I believe. <clears throat> and then the last two buckets in this, uh, this category, clean transportation, and then the reduction or recycling of food waste. Uh, so um, there's a, a whole host of different priorities here. Uh, and then the other uh, category of funding, <clears throat> excuse me, is the Climate Smart Communi Community Certification Projects. Uh, and so, again, I'll just look at the highlighted ones. Create, conduct a vulnerability assessment. How vulnerable is your community uh, to flooding, to uh, storm surges, to other uh, natural disasters? Um, you could tie this in, tie your asset management, stormwater asset management planning process into a vulnerability assessment. They can inform each other. Review existing community plans and identify uh, strategies for adaptation uh, and policies or projects that can decrease vulnerability. Again, looking at the implementation of capital infrastructure, but also creating policies that also reduce vulnerability. And then uh, developing uh, climate adaption strategies. Uh, and, and the last one um, is, uh, you know, updating, maybe you do have a hazard mitigation plan, but updating it uh, and updating it specifically to reduce, uh, you know, identify strategies to re reduce vulnerability. So um, for those who may not know, uh, I, um, I, the, the last couple slides here are really about the uh, consolidated funding application process. Um, and, uh, and so I'll start with by identifying the regional councils. Every project, every application that goes to the state, the consolidated funding application, uh, is first reviewed by the regional council. 
And so you see here, again, this is New York specific, but you see here how the regional councils are uh, broken up. Now, it's not just their review that's important. It's the fact that they get to, out of 100 points, assign 20 points to every project. So if you don't have the buy-in uh, of your region, if your project is not aligned with the region's goals and strategies, uh, it's going to be uh, a little bit tougher for you to get that project awarded if you're now from 100 points down to 80 or, or, or 85 because you have haven't engaged the regional council appropriately or because your project's misaligned with their um, with the, the goals and priorities of that regional council. Now you can go online and look at the, the strategic vision that every region has written so that you have an idea of what those goals and visions are. And I'll show you, I'll, I'll, there's a link for that later in the slideshow. Oh, it's right here. <laughs> so the basics, uh, you know, these regional economic development councils are, 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 are populated by local experts, business, local government, academia. Uh, they're usually co-chaired by the chancellor or president of a major academic institution in that region and uh, the president or CEO of a major business in that region. Uh, so for the Southern Tier, for example, it's the head of Corning, uh, Corning Glass, and also then the president of, of Binghamton University. In the central region, in Syracuse, where I am, it's the chancellor of Syracuse University and the head of our regional economic, uh, uh, essentially our um, it's center state CEO, uh, our kind of economic development agency. So all of those projects, uh, you, any, any of those funding programs, any project you had in mind, you would apply for through the CFA, the Consolidated Funding Application. Uh, it's all online uh, and uh, there's, there's guidebooks to walk you through the application process. There's guidebooks to talk about in much greater detail each of these funding programs. Uh, and, um, and the deadline is, is 4 p.m. On, on July 29th. And there's a link here uh, where you can find all of that information. So I think we're wrapping up here. I apologize. We took a couple of extra minutes, um, and that's my bad. But I get really excited about these funding programs. <laughs> uh, so if you have any questions, I think we can take them now. I, I, if you have anything, please type them into the chat box. It doesn't seem either we've been thorough or thoroughly boring because there aren't any questions. But feel free to contact us. Um, here's our information. Uh, and this is what we do on a daily basis, not necessarily host webinars, but we work with local communities. We work with other technical assistance providers. Uh, and we help folks to, um, to build resiliency into whatever systems it, it is that they're, um, that they're working on. Uh, financial and, and, and economic quality of life uh, environmental resiliency. So I will stop chatting there. If you have questions, we'll take them. Um, Jen, anything you'd like to add? No, I think i uh, just thank everyone for their time today and um, definitely follow back up with us if there's anything that we can be of assistance with. All right, well, with that, we will uh, we'll adjourn today's webinar. We thank you much for your participation. Um, oh, we do have one question. Uh, actually, it's, uh, I think it's not a question, but a statement. Uh, so if you're in the Hudson Valley, there's grants open for resiliency planning and green infrastructure. We'll send that link along um, unless, is there a way for you to? I can put it through the chat right now. Uh, we're distributing, distributing it to everybody on the webinar now. So if you're in the Hudson Valley of New York, there's a, a a special funding program for you there. All right, well, thank you. And, and that funding program in Hudson Valley is due June 30th. All right, folks, thank you. Have a good uh, holiday. And, uh, and like I said, if you, if you have any uh, need, please give us all a call and we can help you out. Thanks so much.